if you want to, to step up and, and take it away. Uh, I really thank you again, Dorothy, for doing this. You sort of last minute uh, put your hat in the ring. So thank you so much. And uh, yes, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. And thank you for organising this meeting. It's incredible to be part of this very, I feel very modern having this multimodal experience with word clouds and Twitter going on in one place and uh, streams of chat in another place and so on. And it's great also having had Amy's prior talk, which I think leads in very nicely to what I'm going to cover. Um, so I realised this morning we are talking about the problems and I, I just sort of to say to people who are raising questions about how on earth can you do this, I think this afternoon is intended much more to talk about, you know, the, the solutions. Um, but I am going to not focus so much on solutions as on problems, just because I think people don't necessarily recognise the severity of some of the problems that currently exist. Because um, publication bias, which uh, Amy's talk alluded to, um, it's been around, knowledge about this has been around for a long time. And I mean, there are studies attempting to document how bad it is, but um, there's a sense in which you almost don't need them because if you ask any scientist, okay, you've, you've done a study and you've got a, a highly statistically significant result um, and you know, you've got another study that you've done which you had high hopes of, but it hasn't worked out that way. In other respects, the two studies are similar. Which one would you publish or would you publish both of them? Most people will absolutely agree that they're going to go for the one that looks most exciting and try and publish that. Um, and it was really in 75, sort of many years ago, Greenwald uh, described this as prejudice against the null. But he pointed out that, um, I can read this quote, as it's functioning at least some areas of behavioural science research, the research publication system may be regarded as a device for systematic, systematically generating and propagating anecdotal information. And that's a pretty tough statement. And it's the propagating that I'm going to focus on quite a lot in this talk, because I think that that's the part that people perhaps don't recognise uh, the severity of. And then this whole thing was was given this much more punchy uh, title, the file draw problem by Rosenthal in 79. So, you know, we've known about this for years, but not a lot has happened to really stop it. It's still the case that, that we're seeing this vast excess of, of publications of, of results that look sexy and exciting and significant uh, and other things just not getting out there. So does it actually matter? Um, and I remember when I was first delving into going social media, and I think it was even pre Twitter, it might have been a comment on something that Ben Goldacre wrote. And I sort of um, nervously wrote at something along the lines of shouldn't we be publishing everything as long as the science is well done and the methods are good. And I got this really scathing reply, which, you know, if we published everything regardless of results, we'd just clutter the research literature with a lot of boring dead end findings. And this was in the early days of my social media life and I sort of crept away feeling a bit wounded and didn't do anything again for a very long time. <laughs> now I'm much bolder and would have fought back. But there's this notion that, 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 that it, you know, we need to just focus on the exciting things. So I want to argue that how I want to demonstrate just how problematic that can be. So I'm going to have a thought experiment with you. And I have to say, had I realised we were on Mentimeter, I could have done this as a Mentimeter sort of poll. But I think uh, it, that might have made be a bit too nerve wracking for me. So um, let's just do it in your heads. But there are some results here from a series of experiments, theoretical experiments. And let's start by saying we've got a treatment um, and we think there's a 50 50 chance that it might work. Um, but uh, we're going to do a study with an alpha of 0.05. So if the null is true, false positive uh, will be so-called significant. We'll get a, a significant result on one in 20 of our experiments. And we've got good power. We've got power of 0.8. So in other words, if there's a real difference, we will see it on eight, eight out of 10 trials. And we observe five studies um, and the first is promising. The next one doesn't find a significant result. And uh, the next is promising. The next is promising. The final one doesn't. So we've got um, just using standard null hypothesis methods, um, a significantly better result in three out of five uh, of our experiments. So the question for you is, is how much confidence do you have that that treatment is actually effective? And I just want you in your heads to sort of think, do you think it's very likely to be ineffective, possibly effective, but a bit unclear or very likely to be effective? Um, and in fact, what uh, bearing in mind that, you know, all the things I've said, the alpha, the power, the prior probability that there's a 50 50 chance, 
Um, this is actually uh, what it looks like if you publish, if you if you compute the log odds of a true effect, which you can do by just saying either there's a real effect uh, that, that this we're picking up or there's not, and then you can see how likely this pattern of results is. And for each negative result that you get, you're going down a bit in terms of your likelihood. You, you go up first because you had that first initial positive trial, then you go down, then you go up again for two, and then you go down. But actually the place you end up in is is much more positive than many people recognise. This was something that Amy also mentioned, that people uh, perhaps over expect that you'll always get something positive. If you've got 80% power, this is the sort of uh, pattern you'd see. And um, as you can see, this log odds scale um, is reaching a level of four, which is means about 55 times more likely to be a real effect than not. So that actually looks like pretty solid evidence. Now let's have a look at a different scenario where we do some more trials. And this time we've got um, one naught 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 one naught 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 one naught 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 in terms of you either sort of get one is a significant result at the 0.05 level of the noughts and null results non-significant. So again, have a think. What what would you think of that? Do you think that's likely to be evidence for or against this treatment? Um, well, if you do it that way. What you start to see is that uh, for each null you're going down a bit and for each positive you're going up a bit and the relative jumps up and down are dependent on the alpha and the power but you go right down to here so you've gone in completely the opposite direction so now you would say well actually it's 55 times more likely that this treatment is ineffective than that it's effective the problem is that this second study was like the first series of studies was exactly the same as the first, except that some of the null trials were omitted. And so this is really just showing you what happens if you tend to suppress uh, results that don't come out as you would have hoped. Um, so this one, the, the ones in black are what I showed you in the first sequence. And if you only saw those, you could come away with a firm impression of something being highly effective, but when you see the full picture, you draw the opposite conclusion. Now, it was recognition of things like this that really stimulated in clinical trials where things really matter, the idea that you should be registering your trial. So we at least know that it happened because the alternative is that we get this cumulative distorted effect. And I think that one of the problems with a lot of science at the moment is that we're very focused on individual studies and you can't really conclude a lot from an individual study. What you need to do is to be trying to do cumulative science where you have a number of studies that start pointing you in one direction or another. But if you then leave out the ones just because you think they're cluttering the literature with boredom, um, you will then start to form a very false idea of what is the case. This was really demonstrated, in fact, my little sort of plots and things that I did here were rather inspired by this paper that I, that I got very excited by, um, by Carl Bergstrom and his colleagues, um, where they were sort of talking about canonization of false facts. And they were talking about exactly this kind of process, whereby if you over time accumulate evidence across a number of uh, experiments for a particular effect or not, um, publication bias really messes you up. And this is this little sort of wonderful diagram that they've done is really just um, representing what I showed you before, that it depends on your alpha level, depends on the power of your study. Um, you make a claim it's true or it's false. Um, but then what you've got is down here a little arrow that says um, if you fail to support or if you support the study, um, you get a probability that it won't get published at all and you don't see it. And so that's what happens. You go through this loop and you go round and round with more and more studies and you build up this notion that something is true because you've never seen the null evidence. So this is really quite serious. How common is it? Well, um, Amy showed you this plot earlier. Um, it comes from a study by de Vries and colleagues that Marcus Manafa was involved in. And again, it's looking at cumulative effects of um, reporting and, and citation biases. So um, they were able to do this study precisely because there was a trial registry for studies on depression. And so they were able to look at all the studies that had been done and what the results were as reported in the registry, regardless of whether they appeared in a journal. But what they were able to show was that um, if you took all the studies here, about half of them actually gave you a, a positive result. Um, but that 
only the about half of the negative results never got published. So this is publication bias in this context, um, whereas the ones that found a positive result, pretty well all of them got published. And then they found on top of that, there was this outcome reporting bias, which again is something that Amy mentioned that uh, Ben Goldacre has documented very nicely that people may then claim that they predicted a different outcome from the one that they actually observed to, so that you get negative trials here that have gone positive because they found something even though it wasn't what they actually predicted. So you have this situation uh, of publication bias in this literature, but bear in mind that in many fields, many fields of psychology, we don't know about all these studies that never make it from here to here. They just disappear. And so we have this impression that the literature is actually far stronger than it is for particular effects. And as if that wasn't as you know, much of a problem as we can deal with, it does get worse still because then you have the issue of does your study actually get cited by other people? And what happens? Well, it's fascinating. So you get these studies that have survived to this point. They've got actually published, albeit perhaps with some spin or misrepresentation. They then get when they get uh, out there, there'll be uh, some sort of in some abstracts and things. There'll be this process of what they call spin or mild spin, which are studies where uh, the abstract actually misrepresents what's in the study, even though the body of the text doesn't. But then there's citation bias. So there is the size of these circles in this final thing represent how frequently these studies were cited in the subsequent literature. So you can see you feel start to feel quite sorry for these little red studies because every time you're red, it, you know, and you have a null result, first of all, you don't get published. Then if you do get published, your outcome gets switched or spun. But then even if you make it to this point, what happens is nobody cites you. So your null results disappear pretty well comprehensively from the literature. It's a very dramatic demonstration of the problem that we have in many areas of science. We are deluding ourselves and we are creating um, these fake facts. Um, and it's really, you know, all, all this canonization of fake facts that, that uh, Bergstrom and colleagues talk about. And then this bias gets propagated through the literature, because if I read a, a peer reviewed paper, I tend to think, you know, I read the introduction, I think, well, the citations this person cites backing up their argument are, are probably OK. It depends who's written the paper, of course. Um, but then what do you do if you were writing your own paper in that area? You will be influenced by what other people have written. Um, if you're a good scientist, you would read the papers that uh, you're citing, but increasingly we're all terribly busy and we just rely on what somebody else said was in that paper. So you can inherit uh, a whole sort of sense of the literature, which is very distorted. Um, and if people only cite materials that agree with a particular viewpoint, you get this same process where a, a wrong viewpoint gets entrenched. And the only way you can try and find out what's really the case is to explicitly search uh, and see if there are other papers that give a different picture. But if you try and tell people to do that, many people say, well, I don't have time to do that. Um, we're all under such time pressure writing papers that we don't have enough time to read papers. And I think this is a massive problem. We have moved away from a model of academic scholarship where you do actually engage with the prior literature to one where you cherry pick out things that fit your views. A partial solution and a solution that was initially sort of again really coming, I think, more from clinical medicine, I think, although I'm, that may be wrong on that. I think uh, I think Ian Chalmers said it was it was from another field, systematic review. But um, the idea is you collect and summarize all the empirical evidence that fits a pre-specified eligibility criteria. So you're trying to really be a good scholar and look at everything that's been written before. Um, and that should help us avoid this issue of um, biasing our, what, what, we could, what we put in our introductions and justifications. But it's not foolproof. Um, I mean, for one thing, we know that the literature is distorted, so we already have publication bias. But even if we didn't have publication bias that meant that the literature was distorted, um, we have bias in terms of what gets into abstracts. And when you do a, a systematic review, you typically don't sit down and read every paper that's ever been written before. You can't, there's often too many. So you will often start by screening titles and abstracts to see was this particular topic uh, mentioned. And if it's not, um, then you 
well, um, missed studies that might have studied, I mean, for example, I talk here about associations between autism and the cerebellum. If people study the whole brain in autism and they find something about the cerebellum, they're more likely uh, to put it in the abstract. Whereas if, if it was a result that was not very interesting, but was nevertheless looked at, it doesn't get into the abstract. So we have this other process where things get uh, left out. So it's really, really hard um, to be certain that we are seeing all the evidence that's relevant to a particular thing that we're investigating. So who's to blame for this situation? I think everybody's to blame for the situation. There's no one cause, um, but I think there are a number of processes that conspire towards it, and we're going to have to fix all of them as far as we can if we're going to improve the situation. Individual researchers, um, I think Amy mentioned confirmation bias, um, and I think, you know, you, I say who's to blame. There's a sense in which we shouldn't be blamed for confirmation bias because it's a, it is a basic way of how we think. And if we didn't have confirmation bias, we'd go through life being completely overwhelmed by everything. But for sort of day to day activities, it's useful to sort of use your prior knowledge of something to justify how you what things you sort of focus on. But the real problem is in the literature is that we all do this thing of only processing and remembering information that agrees with our viewpoint. I've, I've been guilty of this myself and I talk about it uh, in some of my writings. Um, I was very, very fascinated to read Charles Darwin had written something that I thought was very, very wise, saying that in many years he'd followed a golden rule um, that whenever a published fact or a new observation or thought came across me, uh, which was opposed to my general results, to make a memorandum of it without failing at once. For I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from the memory than favourable ones. Owing to this habit, very few objections were raised against my views, which I had not at least noticed and attempted to answer. And of course, Darwin had the luxury of a private income and he sat in his cottage writing um, Origin of Species and many other books and looking, doing tons of stuff uh, quietly and uh, without having to worry about uh, tenure and such like. But the point is that he's making that it's very easy to overlook things if they don't fit in. In fact, quite often those things are, are the more important things, or you need to at least have a way to explain them to people who are going to attack your work. So there's real benefits in sort of taking on board things that don't fit. Um, but I thought that was, you know, I really enjoyed reading that. Well, that's, that's a very wise observation. There's also this, again, Amy alluded to this, there's this what I call moral asymmetry that um, most of us don't feel it's particularly bad to omit a relevant reference. If you know there's pressures on space, and you think, well, I'm not going to go into that reference because it doesn't quite fit what I want to say. Just as it's you know regarded, p-hacking is tended to, people think, oh, well, if I leave out the results that don't quite fit uh, the right picture, that, uh, that's all all right. Um, this is often seen as more acceptable than making stuff up. Um, but it, it can have a very serious consequence, as I hope you've, you've now are beginning to see, um, that leaving stuff out can really give such a distorted picture that it, it creates a wrong impression as what's going on. And Ian Chalmers, who is the sort of uh, guru of, of clinical trials and uh, has been very critical of a lot of the research in this area, did, I remember him once saying to me, failing to publish a completed trial is equivalent to fraud. And I thought, no, surely not. It doesn't sound that bad. But I think he's right in the sense that it, if you see what sort of effects that can have, it is actually quite serious to leave stuff out. But let's let's go a little bit further. It's not just us scientists who are, who are to blame for the situation. There's also journal editors. Um, I have blogged about this endlessly over the years because it's irritated me for years. Um, more concern for newsworthiness than for methods. And I won't go into details in the interest of time, but um, this was prompted by seeing a high impact journal that published a paper on um, children playing video games in and that, how that was useful to cure dyslexia. And it was a tiny, tiny sample. And you knew jolly well that if with that tiny sample they hadn't found uh, anything, uh, it never would have got published. But it was only because this combination of a small sample size and, and a, a big effect size and a, a newsworthy finding that it, that it got published, whereas that combination is, is actually the dangerous combination. Um, journals, as people were asking already in the question time uh, of previous talk, they, they often won't publish negative findings. And again, it's really important, I think, for journal editors to think hard about this. If they're publishing a positive finding, would they have published the same result 
uh, if it had come out negative. Because if the answer is no, I think that suggests that there might be something wrong with the methods. Because if a study is well designed and capable of showing whether something is or is not the case, I think it should be publishable. But quite often these uh, people will publish results that are methodologically quite weak, again, just because they're exciting. Whereas an equivalent negative finding is not published, even if it's methodologically much, much stronger. Um, and then there's also failure to publish replications or failures to replicate work, um, which again is, is I think, um, really quite a concern that if, if you take my view that science should be cumulative, we should actually welcome replications and get the sense that uh, we, we can then form a more sensible opinion of what is actually going on. Um, finally, who's to blame for the situation? To some extent, it has been funders and institutions. Um, there has been this relentless focus on the importance of doing research that's groundbreaking or, or novel or transformational are the words that are used. And I, I blogged just um, earlier in the week about this uh, because I, I was sort of, there was something that prompted me, I can't even remember what, there was a tweet from somebody. Um, but I feel that um, this failure to appreciate that science does need to be cumulative um, has been very, very damaging and everybody feels that they've got to do something incredibly original, incredibly novel. And I drew an, you know, a parallel with a frog on a lily pond that has to hop from one pad to another and you're looking for treasure under your lily pad. Um, whereas I think we should be thinking of ourselves more like termites and termites working together in collaboration, trying to build something that's really cumulative. The problem at present is that we sometimes, insofar as we do behave like termites, we might be building a completely fictitious termite mound because we're trying to we're trying to build on stuff that has really very weak foundations because of all these biases in publication and in citation practices. But I'll stop there to leave some time for questions. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Dorothy. I just want to quickly just take the time to make a couple of announcements. I, I realise in my excitement and enthusiasm, I have started talks slightly ahead of schedule, but not to worry, people can rewind and, and catch up if they tuned in sort of for a particular talk uh, using the, the web browser as well as the desktop app. I've also been informed that we are we are trending on Twitter. We are actually 28th uh, thing that's trending. So that's amazing. Thank you everybody that's that's uh, that's tweeting out. Keep it up. Uh, some nice good news, I think, to fill to fill the uh, Twitter feed. So anyway, uh, thank you again, Dorothy. Let's just get straight to the questions, shall we? So the one one that's been most highly upvoted is um, as a PhD student, it's often worrying that we have to find something significant. Surely no results are results in themselves. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think you should have to find something significant. Um, so if there are institutions, this, this comes down to institutions again, if, if your institution is giving you the impression that to get a PhD, you've got to find something significant, then that is contributing to this corrupting process of science. Um, and I think that I would value a PhD much more if it was an extremely, we're going to talk, I think this afternoon, people will talk about things like pre-registration, but I, to my mind, a, a study that has demonstrated that the student knows how to do a good study, knows how to do a well-powered study, pre-register it, do it carefully in a way that it will yield a result that is useful regard, you know, it will give you, will move you on that graph of things going up and down a sensible degree. Um, regardless of whether the truth is that there is an effect or there's not an effect. Personally, I, I would value that far more. Um, so I'm concerned if I feel that there are students who are still being made to feel they have to get a significant result. Certainly if I'm evaluating a PhD thesis, that's the last thing I, I, I would worry about. Uh, wonderful. So the, the next question is, uh, I think one of the most discouraging pieces of news I read as an early career researcher was the closure of the Journal uh, of Negative Results in Biomedicine in 2017. It felt like a clear message of, at least at the time, people not being interested, uh, devastating, they say. I don't know whether you have any comment to pass on that, Dorothy. Um, I'm not so devastated by it. Um, I think it was a, an interesting move. It was an interesting move by a publisher to try and argue, yes, negative results can be interesting. But to be honest, I don't think they should be sequestered away in their own little journal. I think negative results should be published in the top journals. Um, so I think um, that 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's just really weird that we're evaluating work in terms of just the outcome when what it should be evaluated by is the quality of the methods. Have, have you got a sensible question? Have you got um, uh, have you attacked it in a way that's that can lead to a sensible answer? You know, are you have you got adequate statistical power? Have, are you using appropriate methods? Um, if all of those things are true, then you are advancing knowledge when you do your study. I think the problem is that many people are doing studies that don't aren't methodologically all that strong um, and are underpowered very often in many areas um, so that a, a null result is not terribly interpretable in those circumstances, uh, but people still allow themselves to get excited by what they regard as positive results. And so you end up um, with a situation where we have this terrific imbalance, but um, I mean, for the, for the moment, let's let's talk about COVID. I mean, it is very important to know whether hydroxychloroquine works or does not work. It is as important to know if it does not work as whether it does work. Um, we want a very good study that is capable of answering that question. Um, if we feel that our theories are so un, uninteresting that nobody would be interested in them if you you know you only got a null result, then I think move to another area where the, the theories are a bit more meaningful. Uh, great. Uh, that that sort of moves us on to the next question, actually, which is: uh, Does publication bias only apply to quantitative research? Oh, that's a very interesting one that I've never thought about. Um, I mean, I think qualitative research probably it does. I don't think I don't know if anybody's ever looked at that. I mean, um, but I guess in, I, I'm, I've only done you know put my toe in the water with various bits of qualitative research over the years, and and. My guess, uh, the problem with qualitative research is that it would be, <laughs> by its nature, quite hard to quantify this. But my guess is that there there would be problems that a qualitative study, I mean, suppose you did a study of interviews with people and you were interested in, I don't know, um, attitudes to something and, and you wanted to ga gather qualitative information. I, I, it would make sense to me that somebody who found, who had a load of informants who gave them incredibly exciting and un unexpected uh, comments would perhaps be more publishable than somebody who just told us what we all have, would have thought in advance. My guess is it probably does apply to the same extent, but I, I, it's an interesting one. I've, I've not really uh, really thought about that hard enough to give a very uh, assured answer. Uh, wonderful. Um, we do have, because I've sort of rushed things, we do have a few more time for questions, so do people keep keep up voting and, and, and asking questions in the, the Q&A. Um, this next question is um, by Ben. Abstract bias is yet another reason why we need open access to journal articles, uh, not just the abstracts. I wonder whether there's been much conversation about abstract bias, because that's sort of the, the place where most of this kind of uh, um, results pushing happens. Yeah, no, that's a really good one because I, I think that's absolutely right. I haven't seen that term used and I, I only really started thinking about it uh, when I was, I, I thought the person who made the point to me very clearly was Stan Lazic in, in his book and I, that little diagram I drew, he, he very nicely sort of showed how damaging that would be. And in fact, that I was reading that just at the time when they, I was asked by the Science Media Centre to comment on a paper that was linking um, autism with, I think it was autism, with uh, environmental agents of various kinds. And it was sort of saying pollutants were linked to autism. And when you went to the study, you found that these people had looked at loads of things. It was a huge survey, not just certain sorts of pollutants, but all sorts of environmental things, um, solvents and, you know, various. Anyway, I can't remember the details, but the point I, I I suddenly realized is that if you were doing a systematic review on solvents because that effect in that study wasn't significant you wouldn't find that study even though it dealt with solvents um, so I, I started to realize that yes this is yet another step in you know this whole process is con continually leading us to bias ourselves in favor of these sort of positive associations that may very well not really exist um, obviously we now have machine learning tools that you could um, check articles if, if the publishers would make them available, but it would be very uh, tortuous to do that. Um, and it would be better, I think, if there was some way of ensuring that all of the variables that have been considered in the study could somehow be uh, made public in a fairly brief way, if not in the abstract itself. There's a real problem with abstracts needing to be so very short, 
I find. I, I, I always wonder, I can, in the days of print, I could understand why abstracts needed to be 200 words or so, but I find it quite frustrating quite often that you can't get relevant information from an abstract that I regard as crucial. Quite often people don't even report the sample size in the abstract. I think that's, you know, dreadful. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, Roger Gina Sorella said something similar that, that the APA guidelines ask you to sort of have quite an exhaustive abstract, but it, there's just no way with the journal guidelines that you can fit all that all that information in. Um, there's one uh, one question that's come up that's just shot up um, by Brendan, which is I think there is now too much literature in most areas for a given researcher to physically read and summarise. What are your thoughts on making all results from scientific papers machine readable? <laughs> um, my thoughts on that are mixed. Um, I think my main thought is maybe we should all stop collecting new data and start looking at what we've already got first, but that makes me very, very unpopular with a lot of people. Um, but I do think it's a bit crazy that we've got this vast, vast amount of, of data, much of which is then just neglected. Um, but uh, machine readability is fine at one level and there have been there's, there's quite a lot of meta science projects that do use machine readable data to try and certainly document things like uh, various uh, things like indeed p hacking and, and so on um, i do worry about it though because i think at the end of the day um, you do need a human being reading a paper to understand what's in it and it is a problem if the literature is so vast that we, we can no longer do that um, I think that we need to take a long, hard look at ourselves and just ask ourselves, what the hell do we think we actually are doing in science if we've got to that situation? OK, wonderful. So uh, we're approaching 10 past, so I think it's a good time to um, wrap up with you, Dorothy. So thank you so much again for stepping in last minute. It's been a, a huge help and stress relief. So. <laughs> uh, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again for answering all those questions. Thank you.